Hey folks, so we are going to cover our first lecture in the Asian American in America uh, unit. Um, this is gonna be a three-parter over the next uh, <clears throat> couple weeks. So uh, this is gonna be focusing on the earlier uh, 19th century, and then we'll get into some more contemporary issues in the follow-up. Uh, know that we're almost done for the semester. Uh, we're kind of rounding out the end, uh, but this should still be pretty jam-packed in terms of content, uh, and we'll be introducing some new concepts as well. So first, um, let me get our screen up here. Okay, so um, the focus today is to look at um, one particular concept: this idea of Orientalism. But we're also going to look at the coolie labor system, which is integral into understanding the, the demise or the decline of chattel slavery and the rise of labor exploitation. Um, so we'll be looking at Asian Americans and race um, constructing the Orient, Oriental and Orientalism, uh, Western imperialism in Asia, coolies, the rise of yellow peril, and then lastly, the Chinese Exclusion Act. Our key term for today is Orientalism, and Orientalism is essentially a way of seeing um, that imagines and exaggerates the, the differences of Arab and Asian peoples and cultures compared to that of Europe and the US. Um, the Orient is a kind of old school term. Um, we don't see it used as much anymore. Um, uh, there's a famous movie called The Murder on the Orient Express. Um, and there's this idea of like Oriental rugs. Um, essentially Oriental is a term developed by um, Europe essentially to um, distinguish itself from um, most of Asia uh, in terms of how we can understand them in modernity um, or modernization. Um, most of the Middle East and Asia had, you know, elaborate <clears throat> uh, architecture, science, um, uh, societies, politics, spirituality, so on and so forth. Um, and what Europe essentially tried to do was make that seem backwards through this idea of um, the Oriental. And we'll see some examples of that in photos that I'll show in this lecture. So um, first, we have to go back and remember that like with all other communities uh, or communities of color, Asians have also been racialized in, in very similar ways. Um, uh, they've been ascribed both a race and a color that distinguishes them right from whites, uh, namely yellow. Um, and if we remember that Homo Asiaticus is sallow or this, this idea of yellow and has all of its associated social characteristics. Um, Interactions between Europe and the US, or Europe, the US, and Asian countries motivated this classification and to place Asians within this continuum of race. Remember that um, there's always this kind of social ordering that was happening during the um, 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries. Um, Asian American, Asians, I should say, no less face this similarly. Um, and one thing that's particular to note um, uh, that's a bit unique for Asian communities um, comparatively is that there was this idea that they were um, uh, are stemmed from a pre-Adamite uh, civilization or a pre-Adamite uh, genealogy, um, meaning that their um, ancestral lineage could not be traced back to the Adam or the Adam of the Adam and Eve story, um, which goes back to that idea of polygenesis that we covered um, earlier in the semester, right? This idea that one of the ways in which um, scientists, anthropologists, um, botanists, uh, scholars that tried to reconcile uh, human difference was by arguing that um, there was, you know, multiple uh, origin stories for the human race and, or different human races that originated at different time periods um, and Asians were a part of this, right? And so we can see that, you know, a lot of these classifications here in um, Mongoloid, Eskimo, you know, hot, uh, hot Australian, Papuan, all of these communities are kind of seen as pre-Adamite, but not def um, definitively coming from um, the kind of Anglicized or Europeanized um, uh, Adam from the Adam and Eve story, and therefore not a part of the original um, biblical nature, right? To the right here, we can see a map um, constructed around um, the mid to late 1800s showing um, a kind of race, race and colorism um, uh, geography. So after having this predominantly blackness um, within this negroid kind of um, uh, genealogical classification and then you have this mongoloid which is a variety of different yellows right that 
um, encompass most of Russia, parts of Australia, and all the way into the Americas, right? And remember that um, there were a lot of different um, understandings of race emerging at this time. Again, there's no um, unique difference between communities, but essentially what scientists were trying to reconcile in the Enlightenment period was that there were these fundamental differences between humans and then coming up with all of these hokey theories essentially to explain why they thought these differences existed. Um, and so this gives rise to this idea of, of Oriental. And so um, what Oriental becomes is this way to describe and define um, Asian societies as clearly different from um, European, right? And again, I, I provided the definition but what I wanna emphasize on the right here is this kind of elaborateness that you see in the photographs and the, and the depictions of Asian communities from this kind of barber, uh, barbarian Chinaman with his gun and knife and mouth, right? These angry Chinamen fighting each other, this kind of drunken fiasco, right? Um, you can see the snake charmer here that's very paganistic um, with a naked person, right? And then this other very elaborate uh, Maharaja kind of um, uh, scene where essentially, and again, the idea is to emphasize that human difference in a very comical um, and very um, unique way. One thing to note with Oriental um, is that it's seen as both desirable and dangerous at the same time. So there's a sense that a lot of the um, artwork, the clothing, the, um, the food, the culture, all of those things are very desirable, but also very dangerous, right? They're, they have this... Um, Kind of auspice or aura of um, paganism, of voodoo, of witchcraft, so on and so forth. Um, you may not remember this uh, or may not have been exposed to this. But one thing that I remember growing up and seeing like films like Indiana Jones and those other kinds of pieces of, of cinematic um, or of cinema were always trying to construct um, South Asians and, East, and Southeast Asians as um, these kind of intelligible. Um, uh, exotic people who ate monkey brains and, you know, eyeball soup and those kinds of things, which, you know, um, again, we haven't really discussed in depth here, but a lot of the ways in which we find um, disdain for these types of cultures and communities is because we've been programmed or been told that those things are not necessarily normal, right? But, um, and, and that's a part of that long and ongoing process of racialization that we've been covering over the past couple of weeks. Um, so, What Orientalism helped to really justify was the sense of Western imperialism. And so in the 1800s, there's a kind of shift towards new or shift away from the Americas in sense of trying to keep them as colonies and trying to establish new trade patterns with other um, communities in the East in a way that is very colonialistic. Um, there was already the Silk Road, obviously Marco Polo had made his way East and there were exchanges between Asia and um, Britain and, and most of Europe, um, but as uh, the UK and, or I should say, as, as Britain, uh, France and um, Spain and Portugal started to lose their control over you know, parts of um, the Western hemisphere here, they sought new colonialistic relationships so they could continue to build their empires. Um, and so what the UK was trying to do at this time was essentially um, enhance their trade relationships and profit heavily so they continue, continue their imperial efforts. And, and most of South Asia um, by the late 1900s is actually covered or controlled by, um, uh, I'm sorry, controlled by Britain. And then the US is also starting to move in there, um, understanding that they had a particular way in which they could start to um, build relationships and, and to also exploit folks. And so um, they wanted to sell railroads, uh, military technology to Japan and to China, um, and also import workers from there as they started to see a decline in the slave-based population. Um, this, again, is around the time of the end of Chateau slavery and abolition. And so as <clears throat> both um, groups are starting to, um, both Euro Europe or Western Europe and the U.S. is starting to see the end of its um, uh, reliance on slaves and in the case of Europe, the reliance on um, Western hemispherical colonies uh, for profit, both start to look east to um, seek ways to um, continue to find exploitable populations either by you know, importing laborers, which we'll see in a second with coolies, or in this case with 
Britain uh, find territories they can actually colonize. This next clip is going to focus on the opium wars and actually how Britain had essentially got the entirety of China addicted to opium to essentially create a new colonial relationship um, in which it made them very, it made it very profitable for the uh, for the UK to actually retain much of China. We arrest drug dealers. We criminalize people, mainly black and brown people, for possessing small amounts of drugs like weed. We do this because drugs are bad. Unless, of course, it's your government that's dealing with drugs. Like that time the British Empire got China hooked on opium. Empires of Dirt, a show about Europeans getting rich at the expense of everyone else. Opium had been grown in China since the 11th century, but it was only until the 17th century that usage really took off when people realized you could smoke it instead of just chewing it. By the 1800s, there were foggy back alley opium dens in the streets of Canton, now known as Guangzhou, Shanghai, and even in London's Limehouse on Pennyfield Street. In the early 19th century, Chinese exports like silk, ceramic, and tea were hugely popular in Britain. Opium was one of the few things that British Empire could trade back. It's estimated that as many as 15 million people were addicted to opium by 1890, making it one of the worst cases of national drug addiction ever seen. They would ship opium grown in colonial India to Canton, where Chinese traders would take it into China. As opium grew in popularity, British trade increased. In 1800, 300 metric tons of opium were shipped into China. Four decades later, this had increased to 3,500 metric tons of opium. Opium was a highly addictive drug with similar effects to modern day heroin. Long-term users could experience liver, kidney and heart problems and could die of withdrawal. Opium use had been banned by the Chinese Emperor Yongzheng in 1729 after he saw the effects of addiction on his citizens and again in 1796 by the Emperor Jiating after everyone ignored the first ban. But Britain continued smuggling opium into China. It was simply too profitable not to. The opium monopoly out of India was worth 981,000 pounds in 1831. That's the equivalent of about 100 million pounds today. By the 1830s, people from every level of Chinese society were hooked on opium. After Emperor Daoguang received reports of mass addiction all over the country, he'd had enough. Soldiers burned all the opium they found. British traders lost 20,000 chests of opium, equivalent to about two million pounds. This led to the first opium war in 1839. The British were so angry that their drugs had been stolen that they sent troops to the region to demand economic reparations for the financial losses they'd incurred while illegally trafficking narcotics into a foreign country. They were also angry that China refused to open up more ports to British trade and had disrespected their traders. Back in the UK, the press depicted the Chinese as barbarians who had insulted the honor of Brits abroad. In an act of war, Britain occupied Hong Kong, then a sparsely inhabited island off the southeast coast of China. In 1841, China ceded the island to Britain. A year later, the Treaty of Nanking was signed marking an end to the first opium war. So Britain got what it wanted, money for illegally trafficking drugs into China and a shiny new island base to smuggle opium from, Hong Kong. Opium remained illegal after the war, but the Chinese authorities were basically forced to accept the drug trade into China. Opium consumption ripped through Chinese society like never before. Chinese smugglers quickly realized that if they registered their ships in Hong Kong as British ships, they could keep smuggling opium into China. This triggered the second opium war in 1846, when a Chinese ship flying the Union Jack was seized by the authorities. The Chinese crew was arrested and the British flag was torn down. The British Navy, supported by the French troops, retaliated by seizing Beijing and looting and burning down the Imperial Summer Palace. China was forced to legalize the import of opium. With the opium trade finally legal, imports from British-controlled India nearly tripled to hit 6,500 metric tons in 1880. Fed up with the British running drugs into their country, the Chinese authorities decided that if you couldn't beat them, you might as well join them. By around 1915, moral and political opposition to the drug trade had grown. 
Britain stopped importing opium to China. It simply wasn't profitable anymore. It's hard to quantify the scale of the misery that Britain caused in China or the mess they left behind. And I know personally because my own great grandfather was addicted to opium and eventually died of withdrawal in Hong Kong. And it's something my family still talks about all the time. The British Empire were one of the biggest drug pushers in history, but hardly anyone in the UK knows what we did in China. Pablo Escobar, he's got nothing on the British Empire. And so, as this is starting to rip into Chinese society, there seems there is a kind of um, oh, um, there's a, a social instability that emerges in the country, which um, gives rise to a need for exodus, right? And as we've seen with Harvest of Empire, we have this kind of situation where, um, when distress happens in a country, migration happens, right? And so. The coolie labor system begins to emerge to supplant African slavery systems across the U.S. and the West. Um, coolie is originally derived from a Hindu word for labor or laboring class. Excuse me, laboring class, and the social instability caused by the opium wars uh, uh, presents a new opportunity for exploitation as migrants need to leave or as Chinese folks need to leave the region um, to escape the political and social turmoil caused by. Um, these opium wars, right? And so poor Chinese immigrants um, came as indentured servants under exploitative contracts to the U.S. Um, and, and they were taking, you know, essentially jobs that Americans didn't want, which were originally the so uh, jobs reserved for um, African and African-American slaves, namely agriculture, building the railroads, mining, um, in doing laundry service, domestic laborers, and then obviously running opium dens, which they were bringing into the U.S. Um, from China, right? And a lot of these um, workers, as you've seen in the art article by Moon Jae-in, are also sh uh, showing that these conditions are very similar to those that um, African Americans were facing at the time, right? And so they were, you know, seen as inferior and seen as exploitable for similar reasons as um, African Americans were seen. And these next few videos will give a little bit more context and detail on that. <laughs> During the drafting of the Constitution here at Independence Hall in 1787, the issue of the slave trade had to be discussed. Congress was going to be given the power to regulate international commerce, which would mean that it would have the power to abolish the slave trade. A few of the Deep South states said that they would not join the Union if the slave trade could be abolished. The rest of the South and the North wanted the practice abolished in Virginia, Maryland, and North and South Carolina had already done so. But South Carolina did not want the federal government to be able to abolish the slave trade, even though they had outlawed it in their state. The convention resorted to a compromise so that all of the states would join the new nation. The new government would have the power to regulate the slave trade, but not until 1808. In 1807, the act prohibiting importation of slaves was passed as an attempt to stop bringing more slaves into America from Africa. This act passed with a large majority of both the North and the South supporting it. Its widespread support is probably attributable to the declining demand for slaves at the time and the slave revolt, which happened earlier in Haiti. That slave revolt caused fear to go through the slaveholding states. The same could happen there. Twelve years after that act, another law passed that was in force at the time of the Civil War. That act said that any American who was a crew member on a ship, whether or not it was owned by another nation, which captured people to put them into slavery anywhere, had committed the crime of piracy, a capital offense. It also made it unlawful in the ship subject to seizure if it was outfitted for the trade. This act was on the books, but rarely enforced. In the North, the slave trade was looked down upon, but not to the point where the society was willing to condemn it. In fact, a whole new trade opened up in the 1840s and 50s called the coolie trade. The word coolie comes from a Hindu word that means laborers. With the decline in the African trade, the new coolie trade was open, bringing men from the Far East primarily to work in Peru and Cuba, but also on the West Coast of the United States. This trade was legal because they came over as indentured servants even though few survived their period of indenture. Many were used in the United States in the building of the Transcontinental Railroad. The laborers being brought over, 
this trade was as terrible as the African trade and had about the same death rate during transportation. In the African slave trade or the coolie trade, human trafficking was essentially the same, just on different sides of the country. It showed great disregard for human life and was perpetrated largely by the northern shippers. During the mid 19th century, the Chinese started migrating to the U.S. They arrived in the U.S. when all that a person needed was a boat ticket to enter. The Chinese were the first Asian immigrants to come to the U.S. They first started migrating to the U.S. because of the turbulence caused by the Opium War. Then, the Chinese started migrating because they heard of the gold rush. To the Chinese, U.S. is known as Gumsang, Gold Mountain. Half of the Chinese that arrived in the U.S. resided in the Gold Rush area in San Francisco. Due to the Gold Rush, 25,000 Chinese were in and out of California by 1851. The first Chinese immigrants were accepted by Americans. They were wealthy, successful merchants, artisans, fishermen, and hotel and restaurant owners. They earned some respect by the public, government officials, and employers because they worked hard and were dependable. Some, such as young peasants who came to, U to the U.S. to pursue economic fortune, got low-paid industrial labor instead. The Chinese did not only mine for gold, they also did other jobs such as cooks, peddlers, and soul keeping. After the first decade of the discovery of gold, the Chinese took on jobs that no one wanted or considered too dirty. By 1880, there were one-fifth of Chinese in mining, one-fifth in agriculture, one-seventh in manufacturing, one-seventh of domestic servants, and one-tenth of laundry workers. About 30,000 of Chinese immigrants worked outside of California in trades such as mining, common labor, and server trade. Although the Chinese were once respected and were able to get jobs in the U.S. during the mid-1800s through the 1900s, they had the hardest time pursuing the American dream due to the discrimination, seclusion, and exclusion they faced. Their advanced knowledge in agriculture and their great contribution to building a railroad earned them approval and respect, but their popularity did not last long with the Americans. When coolies started arriving in the mid 1800s, American attitudes about the Chinese became very negative and hostile. Coolies were unskilled laborers that worked for very little pay. Americans' attitudes started to turn xenophobic due to their fear, ignorance, and post-Civil War depression. It was also due to the economic downturn during the 1870s, which caused significant unemployment problems. These problems caused Americans to outcry against the Chinese. The Americans took many actions in the form of legislation against the Chinese. The earliest law that targeted the Chinese was the 1850 Foreign Minor License Tax Law. Another law against the Chinese was the law in 1854 that denied the Chinese right to testify against white men in court. Immigration taxes and laundry operation taxes were passed by legislation to keep the Chinese from success. Many racist labor union leaders blamed the Chinese for the lack of jobs, the past wages, and even accused them for being morally corrupt. In 1870, the Chinese were blamed for the lack of well-paying jobs. Urban and agricultural workers enacted more for the violent acts against the Chinese. As more and more Chinese started coming, took more jobs, and created competition in the job market, the racial tensions rose. The Chinese faced discrimination from several groups, including their minor co-workers. Since the Chinese were low-paid hard workers, 
they thought that this was lowering their wages. Many Chinese were paid only two-thirds of what the white workers were paid. Chinese workers were chased out of mines, agricultural settlements, and cities. The local authorities didn't do much to help the Chinese. They sometimes even joined the actions of the mob. Federal troops even had to be contacted at times to reinforce order. In 1885, at Rock Springs, Wyoming, white miners attacked the Chinese for declining to join a strike for higher wages. This attack is known as the Rock Springs Massacre. Sadly, in 1862 alone, 88 Chinese were documented murdered. Chinese that immigrated to the U.S. were treated inhumanely. Their traditions and customs were violated. Also, they were insulted, imprisoned, beat, sometimes even killed. The Chinese had to go through assaults, arson, and murder. The construction of Angel Island began in 1905 in China Coast. Angel Island, the place where the Chinese were interrogated and detained, is in San Francisco. It was known as the Ellis Island of the West. The original purpose of Angel Island was to handle European immigrants that were arriving to California, but most immigrants that arrived were from Asia. 70% of people kept in Angel Island were Chinese. From 1910 to 1940, there were as many as 175,000 Chinese detained from Angel Island. Instead of being a deportation center, Angel Island was more like a detention center. Untrustworthy incomers were sent to Angel Island and were screened or deported. They were detained and interrogated in a prison-like environment. Since the Chinese government did not keep official records of the population, the Chinese had to be interrogated to figure out their identities and detect if they were actually related to American citizens. The interrogation process that they and me had to go through consisted, consisted of questions that were detailed and irrelevant, which were designed to confuse and entrap the Chinese. The Chinese immigrants had to deal with aggressive questioning about details of their village in China, daily habits of family life, important locations in family history, and other personal information to determine if they were just a paper son. They spent weeks or months, and sometimes even years in Angel Island. Unlike Ellis Island, where it only took hours or days to be processed, they were completely isolated, kept in bad conditions, and separated from their family. The day in needs of Angel Island lived strange, stressful, demoralizing, and humiliating lives. Also, they had no idea what the future held. The Amis in Angel Island were placed in crowded rooms. There were usually about 100 people in bunks that were three columns high in a 1,000 square feet space. The bad treatment received caused a despair atmosphere. The Chinese expressed their emotions in poetry that they brushed the cards on the walls. Their poems written on the walls of Angel Island cried out suffering and sadness. To escape humiliation, some committed suicide. While in the U.S., many Chinese men were afraid to go back to China to visit their wives and children. They were afraid because they dreaded that they might not be allowed back. The 1882 Chinese Exclusion Act prevented further immigration and denied naturalization rights. It exempted merchants, government officials, students, teachers, and visitors. Although they were exempted from exclusion, they were still not eligible to gain citizenship. A reason for the Chinese Exclusion Act was to hinder a surplus of cheap labor. Due to the Exclusion Act, the already high balance such ratio was made even more imbalanced. In 1860, the male to female sex ratio was 19 to 1. In 1890, the ratio changed to 27 to 1. To uphold their population, 
There were countless amount of illegal immigration after the exclusion. The Chinese created paper stamps to illegally immigrate others from China. Paper stamps was an obscure system of immigration fraud. The only way for the exclusion to be overcome was if one proved their citizenship through paternal lineage. The paper sons and paper daughters bought fake papers that will identify them as being sons and daughters of American citizens. At the time of the Chinese Exclusion Act, there were no other racial groups that were not allowed to enter U.S. legally. Paper sons were people who bought false papers and listed non existing sons and daughters to help bring others to the U.S. Although the Chinese Exclusion Act was supposed to only last 10 years, it was extended with the Geary Act of 1892, which added new requirements. The Extension Act of 1904 made exclusion of the Chinese permanent. The Chinese found refuge in Chinatown. Uh, the Chinatowns provided a sense of security and companionship. It is evident that this discrimination towards the Chinese increased as the economic conditions worsened. They used the courts to fight for their rights. Also, they used the Constitution to file over 10,000 lawsuits challenging laws and practices harassing them. The Chinese were excluded from the U.S. for 61 years. Due to the destroyed administration building and the Chinese being allies of the U.S. in World War II, the immigration station was abandoned. On the 7 17, 1943, the U.S. Congress passed the Chinese Exclusion Repeal Act, which allowed the Chinese to legally enter the U.S. again. This act was passed mainly for political reasons, not really human rights. The reasons for the repeal of the Exclusion Act were because, one, the Chinatowns turned quiet and became to be colorful source of attraction. Two, Chinese children were well behaved. And three, China was an ally in World War II, which was the main political reason. The Immigration and Nationality Act of 1964 removed the last barriers of the Chinese. Americans tried to justify their actions by claiming that War and jobs were scarce, and the Chinese were stealing jobs because they were willing to work for smaller wages. Two, the Chinese were sending too much gold back to China and believed that the wealth should stay in the U.S. At the time of the exclusion act, it was the most violent decade of the Chinese in American history. So, right. So as mentioned in the video, um, we see the rise of yellow apparel um, shortly thereafter uh, from, uh, from the rise of the Kuli labor system. And there becomes an antagonistic relationship between um, American whites and um, Chinese immigrants during this time, uh, namely that Chinese folks were growing in numbers. We saw huge amounts of folks coming to the United States, largely because of uh, um, social and political instability in China, again, caused by the opium wars, and then obviously because of economic opportunities um, in the West, namely you know, gold mining due to the gold rush and then the need for agricultural workers. And if we go back um, to our Latino, our Latinx and Chicanx um, in the US unit, we understand this phenomenon of um, dual factors motivating migrations as push-pull migration, right? factors pushing folks out of their communities and then factors pulling folks into certain communities, right? Um, and so uh, this sense that there was a growing amount of people, that there was um, wage instability and, and labor instability in the, in the fallout from the Civil War. Again, there was a recession during that time in 1870 um, and a variety of factors um, kind of led to these conflagrations of race tension, right? And so um, we, come to know this period as the driving out period. So in 1882, um, the Chinese Exclusion Act was passed, which I'll, I'll cover in more depth in the next slide. Um, but anti-Asian sentiments begins to grow 
Um, there are riots that are happening in Santa Ana, um, Los Angeles, San Francisco, Berkeley, and other parts of the country at this time. And um, we see this kind of um, solidification of um, one, the kind of antagonistic racist, racist notions against Asians um, emerge and, and kind of get popularized in media. You can see that here in the bottom, you saw several examples of that in the previous video. Um, and then we also see uh, obviously this numerous amount of individuals who are, uh, <clears throat> uh, or these numerous instances of violence that happen across the US. This next video will give a little bit more historical context on that. A recent Pew Research Center report found Asian Americans are the fastest growing racial or ethnic group in the United States. The report also predicts the population of Asian Americans is expected to surpass 35 million by 2060. But as the population grows, anti-Asian rhetoric and violence is surging across the U.S., and it is starting to mirror our country's exclusionary history with Chinese immigrants. For more on this, let's bring in Michael Luo. He's the editor for the TheNewYorker.com. Michael, welcome. I'm really glad we have a chance to talk about this because there are such echoes of the United States history in some of the rhetoric that we're hearing today. So first of all, what's really interesting, and you write about this, is the thing that initially attracted immigrants from China to specifically the American West is the exact same thing that attracted Americans from the Eastern U.S. to that very same region. So tell us, what was happening in the United States in the mid-1800s, and how did that affect affect the population of certain areas in the U.S. in the decades afterwards? Yeah, this was the American frontier. Uh, this was um, the California gold rush, the discovery of gold in 1848, and that led to this exodus of people to the West Coast. Uh, and that drew, um, you know, people from across the country and from uh, China, particularly Southern China and Guangdong province. And um, the other thing that was happening was there were jobs. Uh, the Transcontinental Railroad was um, being, the tracks were being laid and, and that was a massive uh, uh, labor pool and, and Chinese workers uh, ended up providing a lot of that. And um, the opportunities here were just uh, better economic opportunities here than in, in back in China where there, there was some serious uh, economic issues going on. There was turmoil going on in Southern China. And um, that just led to this exodus of people coming to uh, California. It's interesting, though, Michael, because you had immigration coming from China, immigrants coming from China. You also had immigrants coming from Europe. You talked about the um, Chinese workers with the railroad. But why is it that specifically Asian immigrants were viewed so differently than European immigrants in the United States at that time? Yeah, I mean, the it's interesting. The Irish immigrants obviously were coming around uh, in the early 1800s and experienced uh, discrimination and, and there was a nativist movement that uh, 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 rose up against uh, Irish immigrants. Um, uh, but remember, um, eventually, um, the Irish immigrants uh, acquired um, power at the ballot box. They were able to vote and became a, um, you know, a political constituent, a powerful one. And um, at this point, though, um, because of the way uh, American laws were written non-white uh, immigrants were not able to become citizens. Uh, this, this comes from the uh, 1790 law that uh, governed the naturalization process and Chinese immigrants just didn't have that. And so um, there was just this level of vitriol and violence directed towards uh, Chinese immigrants, um, just really horrific violence. And um, it persisted and led ultimately to um, the Chinese Exclusion Act, which excluded, um, which was the first law that, uh, federal law that excluded uh, people from America on the basis of race. And um, there was a, that was followed uh, by a period called the driving out, that, uh, where communities across uh, the American West drove out Chinese immigrants and just forced them to leave. Can you just uh, talk a little bit about 
um, you know, before the China, uh, before the Exclusion Act, this violence that was perpetrated on Chinese people, and specifically in 1871, you wrote about an instance that happened. I don't think a lot of Americans might be familiar with, um, but to hear about the level of violence that was perpetrated against Chinese may be surprising to some people. Tell us what happened. Yeah, this this was a the, uh, this was in Los Angeles in 1871, and um, the, uh, it's a little unclear the details of how uh, it exactly erupted. Um, uh, a white uh, uh, police officer was investigating uh, gunfire, I think, in Chinatown, and um, uh, was shot. And uh, another white man came to help, and he was shot. And um, this angry mob uh, um, descended upon Chinatown, and um, in the end, 20 Chinese were killed. Um, most of them uh, lynched. Uh, they were their uh, bodies were hung uh, in the moonlight, uh, and um, uh, one of the worst incidents of mass lynching in America's history. Um, didn't occur with uh, with uh, Black Americans actually, but in, in, with uh, uh, Chinese, uh, and it was just a. That's just one example. Uh, there were other uh, horrific massacres uh, in Rock Springs, uh, Wyoming. Um, there were other uh, examples of um, of times when uh, uh, really there uh, you might use the term uh, a, a racial pogrom. Um, where uh, not only were uh, were uh, Chinese immigrants uh, killed, beaten, uh, assaulted, but uh, uh, really just forced to uh, leave. So you mentioned the Exclusion Act. I just want to read a little bit from your piece because you quote Senator John Franklin Miller, a Republican from California in 1882, who introduced this bill that uh, barred Chinese laborers from entering the U.S. He said, quote, we ask of you to secure to us American Anglo-Saxon civilization without contamination or adulteration with any other, Miller said, China for the Chinese, California for Americans, and those who will become Americans. Michael, do you see echoes in some of the political rhetoric um, that we have heard in uh, recent times, uh, you know, with what we saw back then in 1882. Yeah, no doubt. Um, uh, you know, when uh, when when Trump would use sort of language about, um, uh, remember when the uh, he 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 tweeted about uh, the four congresswomen uh, and they they should go back to their country. The um, there were echoes. Uh, I just heard echoes of uh, our history, and um, when we think of uh, the, the 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 slurs around uh, the coronavirus and uh, kung flu and China virus and that kind of thing, uh, it, it's it's just uh, to me the, the the recent surge in attacks against Asians um, wasn't surprising. It, it's uh, just part of our uh, exclusionary past, uh, and and uh, you know, as Faulkner said, the past is never not really the past, um, and, and it really is uh, uh, reflected in our current reality. So, again, what we can see here across now four different examples in four different communities is that um, racist violence becomes one of the key mechanisms to maintain the boundary of race. And like with the um, Dakota massacre, where thirty eight indigenous uh, individuals were lynched. Um, we see another example here, 20 uh, Chinese men, people or uh, China, whatever, China men are lynched right in LA and Chinatown. Um, we saw a comparable weight of Latino or Mexicans being lynched um, compared to African Americans. And then obviously lynching is a, a common kind of mechanism to enforce uh, racial violence against African Americans. So all four communities facing very similar um, conditions, exclusion, violence, uh, so on and so forth. And so as um, the speaker mentioned in the previous video, um, we see this kind of give rise to the Chinese Exclusion Act. It's one of the longest racially exclusionary policies ever passed by the U.S. Uh, from 1882 to 1943, so literally about 60 years. Um, predicated, it's, uh, or its repeal was predicated on the fact that, um, you know, the, uh, the China helped us in World War II, and that there was a sense of social stability and, and actually really this kind of contempt of subordination by um, 
Chinese folks, um, you know, after this period of time, you know, especially after all this violence, right? Um, you know, essentially the law was predicated on keeping the country white, um, as the journalist mentioned that, you know, much of the law um, introduced by California Republicans was centered on trying to maintain, um, you know, Anglo-Saxonness in um, California and across the United States. Um, you know, and then it sets the framework for discriminatory and racist immigration laws in the future, right? We see this in terms of um, other types of current immigration law, namely the um, illegal immigration um, reform and immigrant responsibility, um, can, uh, immigrant responsibility act um, passed by uh, President Clinton, which created a framework for, um, I'm sorry, uh, uh, branding um, undocumented immigrants coming from Latin America as, you know, quote unquote, illegal immigrants. Um, obviously, Operation Wetback is very similar in that it actually used a racial slur uh, in the language of the law and the, the policy of mass deportations from 19, uh, 1942 to 1965 is very similar in the same way that we see with the Chinese Exclusion Act, just this kind of blanket approach to um, removing uh, a race or a, a group of people right, um, uh, because of social instability, so on and so forth. Um, and one thing that we do want to note with the Chinese Exclusion Act is that it's actually derived a lot from previous um, race, racist or racializing laws. And what I mentioned here is the, the Indian Removal and Indian Appropriation Acts, right? Um, uh, President Andrew Jackson you know, passes these laws specifically targeting, targeting Native Americans. And we see this kind of historic pattern where um, whether we're looking at the slave codes, black codes, Indian Removal Acts, um, the Chinese Exclusion Act, Operation Wetback, the Greaser Act, so on and so forth, is that um, the United States is not um, bashful in terms of creating very overtly racist laws. And all of these are kind of predicated on removal of individuals, um, particularly during um, uh, economically tense circumstances, which you know, namely are not the fault of these individuals, but rather than looking at the system which has created those um, conditions of economic instability, we rather just you know, blame a minoritized population, um, deploy violence against them and ultimately um, actually exclude them, right? So with that, uh, I'm gonna close for today's, but we've covered a lot. So we've looked at Asian Americans and race, um, constructing Orient, Oriental and Orientalism, how this, um, in this framework of Oriental gives rise to this um, or notion or this, um, it gives rise and enables this um, Western imperialism in Asia, both by Britain and the U.S., and we saw some of the effects of that with the Opium Wars, um, how the Opium Wars kind of led to the coolie trade and what the coolie trade was in the context of um, slavery and its relationship to African slavery, um, the rise of Yellow Peril, um, which was, again, this notion that uh, we were going to construct Asians as other um, and deploy uh, racist violence against them, namely because of um, you know, our disdain for non-white individuals and um, uh, competing or um, um, uh, uh, entangled economic instability. And then lastly, the Chinese Exclusion Act, um, which was you know, one of the very first racist immigration laws um, against a targeted population, which is derived from other racist laws and also becomes the framework for future racist immigration laws that we'll see in the future. Um, and again, our key terms for today's Orientalism. So with that, email me if you have any questions and thank you for tuning in.